Look beyond the cutting edge and sharpen your skill set with quality education at Tirthankar Mahavir University, preparing professionals for a new India. Also, it is when you say bell curve being used in uh, uh, you know performance appraisal. I am trying to say that it is a social theory designed to sort people out. and identify a limited number of winners and losers that is a basically a social theory that means we predetermine that some people will perform poorly and others would perform exceedingly so that's a social theory that what we are saying that majority of the people are an ordinary guys there are very few who are excellent and there are very few who are poor and therefore this concept of bell curve being used in the corporate sector comes from this social theory now when you look at the interpretation of the bell curve there are uh, you know three uh, important things which i must look at one is the two different types of uh, statistics second statistical majors and third is how do i actually read a bell curve so let me uh, go one by one how do i first read a bell curve i need to have these five important aspects looked into when i uh, analyze a bell curve first one is peakness whether the peak is sharp wide or flat because based upon this form of a peak it will give you a different kind of meaning you will be able to conclude a uh, differently based upon the you know this nature of the peak about the uh, you know population or your sample which you are drawn then the spread at the base how spread the curve itself is and that comes from standard deviation symmetry whether the curve is symmetrical or asymmetrical symmetry deals with whether the curve is uh, on the right side skewed or on a left side skewed then you have a tailedness how long are the tails no we when we talked about two tails how long they are and how fat they are that is the tailedness and then of course i spoke about a standard deviation so these are the five parameters i would like to use while you know interpreting understanding and reading the bell curve now let's look at bell curve <clears throat> uh, based upon the employee performance data this is how it looks like you know there are a good number of average performers in any organization that's a, that's a basic premise of the bell curve whether it's correct or not we'll look at separately in detail but when i actually use a bell curve this is what i mean now the use of is correct or not we'll look at separately but once i use a bell curve for reviewing the performance of my employees i'm saying hey 68% of you are average performers and 16% are very high and 16% are very low this is a premise with which i start my bell curve being used in corporate for reviewing the performance of my employees now if you look at this figure which is a hand drawn this is what would emerge based upon the data now you would also realize that this kind of curve is possible only when you are dealing with a large population central limit theorem states that the size of the population has to be minimum 30 so as you move beyond the size of 30 the shape of the curve start looking like a bell or a normal right so as you keep adding more and more size whether to the population or to the sample you would have a shape coming much better towards a normal curve now central limit theorem also says it says if the sample size which you are dealing with is greater than 30 it will form a normal curve irrespective of whether the population was normally distributed or not please keep that in mind i repeat a uh, 
sample which you have taken for your study, if it is greater than 30 and you plot that characteristics, it will give you a normal curve. curve and if the size keeps increasing, it will keep coming towards the perfect normal in spite of your population being not normal. This is what the central limit theory states. Look at what does the HR do? Here, the difference is the HR force fitted the curve. Please underline what I'm saying. It is not the curve which has emerged from the data which you have generated in your organization based upon performance appraisal tool. This is a force fitting by the HR. HR based upon that hypothesis or that theory of uh, normal distribution, he tries to fit his employees in this category. He say, okay, hey, top 20%, is here the formula follows is 70, 20, 10. So he say, his philosophy is, or his assumptions are, that it's only 20% of the employees in my organization who are top, top performers. Majority are average performers and 10% how to be low performing guys. So based upon this assumption, I handpick along with the respective managers and force fit the people into top performance and the lower performance. Now look at the tragedy here. What, what is actually the problem here? Suppose your organization has performed exceedingly well, right? That means everyone has contributed. All your employees have performed good, very good, because that comes from the organization. Organization has performed very well. So there is a linkages between organization performance, department performance, and the individual performance. Therefore, what is the HR doing now? Organization performing very well, that means all employees performed well. In spite of that, he, using the bell curve, says only 20% have performed exceedingly well. Out of the very well performing guy, 10% have to be poor performers. Now, this is what I want to highlight in my uh, discussion with you. This kind of force distribution or force fitting the curve will create a lot of problem in the organization, which we will look at subsequently. Now look at measures of shape. You know, I, I talked about three different measures. The first measure is measure of central tendency or location. That is where my data are located, central tendency. That means uh, most of the characteristics have a tendency to be towards center. Right? That, that's the location. And that's what your normal curve actually also indicates. Then you have measure of dispersion. Dispersion is nothing but it's it indicated through a standard deviation. What is the difference between each individual and the average, whether it's a large or a small? If it is a large difference, then you will find your normal distribution curve being uh, having a, a different type of T. Spread. Similarly, the third one is measure of shape. Two measures of shape. One is skew and another one is kurtosis. You look at in the diagram, blue diagram just below the normal, there is a positive skewness and there is a negative skewness. Negative skewness and positive. You look at positive skewness. Positive skewness means you have a larger values towards greater values. Large number of people have been, let's look at related to the uh, performance assessment. Large number of people have been assessed as high performers by the respective managers. So you have a normal curve being skewed towards right side. And when you have a manager 
giving everyone lower grades. That means she has uh, assessed them as average and poor. Therefore, it will have a negative skew. That means it will be skewed towards the left. Hence, there is a problem of rating error. You know, there are three rating errors which we have. One is a central tendency. Most of the people being rated as average. So you will have a large peak, which is indicated below. We'll have a large and a fat peak. Uh, uh, if you look at down the, the, the last uh, uh, curve, you see the green one, it is not sharp, right? And if you have your manager rating everyone on the average, that means committing the central tendency error, you will have that curve. If he is strict, tendency to be very strict in his assessment, that means he is trying to have a lower rating given to everyone. On a scale of 1 is to 5, he rates most of the people 1, 2, 3. There's another one who rates liberally. Right? He would rate people on a scale of 1 is to 5, 1, 4 and 5. So most of the people he has rated them as 4 and 5. And that is what the platycortic courtesies will be. And the green one is leptocortic. Right, and normal is the blue one. So this particular curve, that is normal distribution curve or a bell curve should have been used for identifying the errors in rating by the respective managers. That means by plotting the performance of the employees on these curve, you will find your curves not being normal. Either they will be skewed negatively or positively, or they will have platycortic or a leptocortic courtesies. By looking that, you can identify the rating errors. That means there is definitely going to be a non seriousness among the managers. That is why it has resulted into a D shaped curves. Let's look at the next important. Is it necessary to have performance management and bell curve used in organization at the end of the year? I, my viewpoint is yes, it is necessary to use the PMS, not the bell curve. Why? It, let's look at. From three perspectives, I consider it's important. First one from organization's perspective, second one from individual perspective and third one from HR perspective. Now from an organization's perspective, there is so much at stake in an organization, right? Therefore, performance of individuals have to be evaluated, right? So that, you know, reward good performers, retain good performers, or attract good performers, and those who are not doing good, advise them, train them, or whatever action is required to, to be taken by managers and HR department, it is necessary. Similarly, for an individual, it is necessary to know what kind of performance is expected from him. Right? What at the end of the year management wants from him. And he also wants to know how his performance would be rated against what benchmarks. What kind of standards would be used for assessing his performance. Right? And he will also like to know how he or she will be actually uh, uh, rewarded for his or her performance. So for individual, it becomes necessary. Similarly, for an HR, yes. HR would have a great tool to hide behind some objective way of rewarding and punishing people. And that tool is a wrongly used bell curve. That's the reason he wants to, or she wants to use it. It will also help the HR to recognize the rating errors, like how lenient the managers are, how strict they are, or what kind of central tendency they have used in terms of assessing their employees. 
And uh, another important thing for a manager is, uh, the manager would like to attract, retain the talent and reward those good performers. Hence, it, it is important for him uh, to reward good performers. And uh, finally, I say this tool is good enough for large manufacturing organizations. To be frank, this tool, of course, uh, is of 18th century statistical tool, which it came first into uh, picture. But uh, as far as HR applications are concerned, this was started to be used somewhere way back in 1980 uh, in GE, General uh, Electrics, under the leadership of Jack Wells. Now, at that point of time, please understand the difference now and that time. At that point of time, although economy was more uh, dominated by manufacturing organizations, so GE had a large number of factories across the world. So he wanted to assess his managers, factory managers, and uh, you know, weed out poor performance and reward the good performers. So he had a large population of similar jobs. A factory manager across the globe is same job, right? Therefore, having a large population and then developing a curve out of that is okay. But in reality, when you look at an any organization, an organization has number of departments. Each department's job roles are different. And uh, if, if you are going to look at uh, size of each department, and within the department, you will find different job roles. So similar job roles, people will be much less than 30. Hence, you will not be able to have a bell curve formed out of the data. So you'll start forcing the, or force fitting the bell curve. So a little bit about the bell curve. It is force ranking method, we, we popularly call it rank and yank. So what we do is first we rate the performance of employees on whatever the tool they have, and then we rank them. The assumptions is about that there are high performers around 20%, average performance around 70%, and 10% are low performance or below average. That, that means a large chunk of employees perform at average level, and employees are at both ends, lower as well as higher end. This is the assumption which in a HR forces on the employees. And so with each of these, you could, you know, make up your mind, hey, are we actually on the right direction in using this particular tool? Yeah. It is a statistical tool personally being managed, I say managed, by the HR and the manager. Why it is being managed? Because it's being forced faced. Okay, and there's a lot of subjectivity involved while they prepare this particular tool. Though, they call it an objective, but when it comes to preparing the tool, a lot of, uh, you know, politics under, uh, uh, you know, underwater currents flow while preparing this tool. It's supposed to identify irregularity and biasness in manager's assessment, supposed to be identified, but that is not being used by the manager as an analytical tool. So what we ultimately end up doing is we start rationing the performance of employees and cull out winners and losers within the organization. And that has a large implications both for individuals and the organizations. And definitely it is suited for large and manufacturing organizations. I'll give four different perspectives why I want to give a burial to this particular tool. These four perspectives would be from statistical perspective, HR perspectives, psychological perspective, and a strategic perspective. Okay, let's look at this, the statistical form. I said, it is not formed from the data, but it is force fit. It is an analytical tool, not categorization. You know, ultimately using this, the HR categorizes the entire lot of employees as a, uh, top performers, average performers, and poor performers. It helps identify outliers on both ends. You know, the tails on both ends provides you the outliers. Who are outliers? That means both top performers as well as poor performers. It requires data homogeneity. That means data 
drawn from the large population and similar job roles, similar population, which in current context of organization with knowledge economy, it will be very difficult to have that large population having similar job roles. It identifies large variances in managers rating. In practice, in practice, look at now. Let's take an example of an organization where you have all people who have performed exceedingly well. So when you force with them to a bell curve, you create star performers, sorry, uh, ordinary performers out of the star performers. Because you have to force fit somebody in an ordinary performer that is an average and a poor performer and only 20% in the lot. Though your all employees are performing exceedingly. Similarly, similarly, if your organization has performed ordinarily, an average performing organization would create star performers out of ordinary performers. So it, is a, it has an ir, inherent contradiction, right? So when you look at these contradictions, how come such a tool could be used for reviewing the performance. Now let's look at psychological perspective. Hey, statistics cannot reflect the way people perform. People are very complex. People have different drive. People have different motives. People have different skills and knowledge sets. So you can't have a normal distribution coming out of the people's performance. It cannot. Similarly, since you ration the performance of employees as losers and winners, it has great implications on them, like their moral motivation suffers. There, is, there becomes an unhealthy competition within the organization and coherence with the, within the team also suffers. So you, you have a uh, you know, good number of people especially those who have been considered a poor performers, though they have performed well, this is what happens to those particular people. So you are unhealthy competition, unnecessarily growing within the organization. Look at the HR perspective. The HR should use this tool for removing biasness in the manager's rating. Uh, a research by Aon Hughes says that uh, there is a positive correlation which exists among the organization performance, department performance, and the employee performance. If that is true, then how can you have 10% of the people forced to be poor performers and majority of them the average performers? That's again a contradiction. Should have been used for analyzing performance rather than force fitting it them for the rewards. It definitely would have worked better in the 80s and uh, early 90s where you know, your economy was basically dominated by manufacturing companies where most of your uh, job roles were you know, fitted to the uh, manufacturing and you, you had uh, uh, both uh, you know, infrastructural and technological constraint on the performance of the people. So individual's brilliance was much less influencing the in performance. Hence, this kind of tools was, uh, uh, you know, was Im important or as well it suited to that condition. But another important, uh, you know, uh, drawback of this tool is it fails to identify potential of the people, predicting performance of the people. Hence, you cannot use it for HR planning. And similarly, there is, a, there is a gap between a HR and a business linkage based upon, since it is based on historical data. So nothing of future sort uh, can be thought of based upon this uh, tool. Okay, strategic perspective. Uh, since it is all based upon historical data, there is no linkage with the strategy. This tool cannot talk about how do we prepare employees uh, based upon the strategic needs of the organization. You know, when, when you develop your strategy, you can predict uh, 
uh, what kind of uh, jobs would be in the future, what kind of skills would we need. But this tool does not give us any kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, information about linkage and fails to prepare employees for the future challenges of the organization. And these are my four perspectives uh, based upon which I say, hey, give burial to the employees. You can go back home and think of all these perspectives and make your own uh, decision about it. Now, let's look at what's the option. How do you make our PMS far more objective and uh, uh, suited to the requirement? I would say, rather than using a bell curve, let's use a power lock curve because jobs in the organizations are today follow power lock curve. I'll, I'll deal with this power lock curve separately what exactly it is okay. and use PMS specific to the organization characteristics. That means stop importing the PMS from other organizations because each organization is a unique. These job profiles are unique. The people are unique and look at your organization's requirement rather than fitting your assessment tool uh, to all and sundry. Okay. I, I would suggest the redesign the tool based upon inputs from concerned departments because each department emphasizes a different activity. Hence, the performance means different to different departments. It's, it's better to restart this particular tool from the scratch. You know, we normally call it zero-based budgeting. So scrap it completely and have a fresh thinking on how do I develop my PMS tool. Redesign the tool based upon functional variability. Most important, whatever tool you develop, please measure its reliability and validity of the performance data. That means whether the tool is measuring what you want to measure or not, or it is measuring the person, or it is measuring the performance which is not related to even the concerned departments. So unless you measure the validity, I, I wouldn't say the data coming out of that would be true. Similarly, measure the reliability. That means whether the tool major a given characteristics, similar way if you measure on repeated work times. That is reliability. I would suggest that when you develop your tool, please follow cafeteria system. That means give options to the people to select the performance criteria. Please respect the individuality, differences in individuality. Each individual is different. Their skill sets are different. Somebody is good at an X skill, and somebody's Y uh, is good on another skill, etc. Use principles of PMS design. I will discuss these principles in detail about the PMS design. Okay, follow those fundamental principles. You will end up having a better validity for the, your tool, and set smart objectives. Objectives that are very specific. They are measurable and they can be attained by the uh, employee and uh, they definitely they are resource. That means a manager's role here comes to provide necessary support and resources to the employee to attain his predetermined uh, performance. Okay, if this is done, you will end up with a better tool. I'll, let's have a principles of design, you know, there are a couple of them I'll quickly run through. Always link your performance tool to the strategic goals and vision of the organization. It should run down, you know, look at the vision at the first and then the objectives, then your carriage and then match it to the performance approach. So you have a perfect alignment between your organization's vision and your you know, performance appraisal tool. Okay, link it to the individual carriage. Don't have two different sets. You measure something else and you ask employee to do something else. Also see 
your criteria which you have developed for performance appraisal they are relevant to the job holders responsibilities look at the objectivity and transparency that means you, whatever you want to measure can you measure in terms of numbers or in quantitative values or you will have to only make a guess now if you do that then you know the performance uh, uh, outcomes uh, cannot be assessed objectively and also give freedom to the individuals to choose performance criteria provide suitable weightage to the performance criteria that means <laughs> each criteria cannot have equal weightage there are certain jobs certain activities in a given job profile more important than the others uh, if you are so interested in bringing qualitative aspects you are welcome to bring qualitative aspects but don't include in the calculation of overall performance i would suggest that you can uh, use uh, qualitative parameters as an interlock to the performance appraisal <laughs> then link this to the outcomes outcomes of the performance appraisal must be linked to the rewards incentives and increments if you fail to do that people not will take it seriously whether it's a appraising manager or an employee let's have an opportunity for mutual setting up and uh, uh, reviewing the performance targets don't force the targets on the employee sit with them and decide and let the employee also have an appraisal self appraisal opportunity and then they should uh, have opportunity for moderation and finalization of the final targets as well as ratings okay now this is some of those criteria which you can use that principle sorry uh, i have worked out an example for a university right and that example would give one an idea how to make a performance appraisal objective right i have taken total 300 points now this 300 points is uh, nothing sagacious about it you could think of 400 200 but the points should be sufficient enough to earn them you know they should be attractive enough and uh, should look uh, you know attractive to the employees to put their efforts for earning those particular points hence i have put 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 eight criteria in a higher education institution and these are the various dimensions on which our uh, faculty members are supposed to work on put their efforts spend time when they are on the job now if you look at i have a different score for teaching and research and publication now this is left purely to the organization based upon their vision or objectives some of the organizations which are older enough would like to have a greater emphasis on the uh, research and publications hence you can give greater weightage to that a uh, new organizations probably would be more of in teaching in nature so the greater weight is to be given to the teaching now to taken these parameters i have further taken a single criteria and elaborated based upon my principles which are defined that means look at the individuals look at the sufficiency of uh, activities on which individuals can choose from that is cafeteria system look at this okay so uh, the research and publication criteria has been subdivided into four sub criteria and that 100 points have been further subdivided again given a weightage research paper published research supervision research paper presentation in conferences research projects and patents published are uh, awarded this this is a further sub and within each sub criteria if you look at i have further given them more opportunities to choose from that that's a basic cafeteria look at this is a cafeteria so under one head that sub head that is research paper published i have 1 2 3 4 5 6 activities in which based upon the interest of the faculty and his or her strength one can choose 
and earn points out of it. He can have, for example, 20 points for one publication in index journal, can gather two, 20 points from publishing UGC listed journals and have one book published in, with national publishers, so he gets a 50 points. Research supervision, 15 points. Looking at that faculty members, some of them are very young. Some of them are, you know, uh, quite experienced and have been in the organization for long. So, so and some of the faculty are not uh, even, uh, you know, uh, PhDs themselves. So how would they, in fact, earn these points? So if you look at the last point, two points for PG and ampule level dissertation supervised and one paper published out of the dissertation. So there is an opportunity for the uh, uh, faculty who is not himself a uh, PhD and as well he's new to the organization. So he can earn these points. Similarly, all of them, you know, there, there, there are multiple choices available to the faculty to earn points. Research projects and patents, again, multiple points. Okay. This is how we go about developing a, a performance management system, which is far more objective and acceptable to the employees. Now I look at some of the new tools, alternative tools, which I talked about. Some of them, you know, there are about 10 of them, but I would discuss with you some of the important ones like nine box method or a nine box grid, uh, power lock curve, or a continuous performance uh, management. Okay, absolute rating, I already shown you uh, through an example and performance value matrix. Let's look at the uh, first one, nine box grid model. Okay, it is an individual assessment tool. And it actually evaluates both current and potential performance. Perf current performance of the employee and potential of the employee. Okay. However, there are certain debates on whether potential of an employee could be assessed objectively. Yes, it could be uh, based upon uh, employees' uh, you know, responsibilities which you give, uh, the projects which you give to him, and discussions which you have with the other managers under whom they worked as a team member or under a project. Okay, based upon that, you can assess a potential employee. It assesses current talent pool and relates it to the strategy. That means, as I mentioned, when you develop a strategy, you also have to take a stock of your people's requirement, what kind of people and what kind of job roles a new strategy would have. So you like to assess what is the current pool which would match or which will meet my requirement of the new strategy. Okay, employees are here mapped against two dimensions. One is on the current performance and another one is a potential assessment. Based upon which you create nine boxes and you then, you know, uh, based upon assessment, you assign the employees to those nine boxes. So most important here is uh, organizations get a different perspective on the value of current skills and the aptitude of the employees for future activities. So your, your perspective is not only uh, of a, you know, uh, your assessing officer, but of the other managers under whom they also have worked. So there are a number of uh, uses of such tool. Uh, it can be used uh, very well for success and planning, talent management. That means uh, based upon in which box the employee lies, uh, you recommend for him what he or must she must do in the future, how you would nurture them, how would you train them. Okay, uh, yeah, definitely used for current performance review and can also be used for training and development and of course identifying potential leaders based upon their potential as well as current performance. Originally, when we look at this grid, which was basically uh, developed by McKenzie way back in 70s, uh, the emphasis was on leadership, but uh, subsequently it was adapted for other uh, groups of employees also. Okay. And uh, other 
the tool which we discussed, uh, you know, bell curve. See, bell curve is a perfect case of bad money driving out good money. These tools were almost simultaneously developed and started being using. Since Belka was used by Jeff Wells for, you know, uh, assessing his managers across the globe, the popularity of the Belka actually suited. And uh, this curve was actually, like, this box, nine box was relegated behind and uh, people stopped using it. The, the process which we use in uh, nine box uh, grid, in fact, provides very constructive conversation with the employees, which helps us to improve interpersonal relationship with the employees. Because when you, uh, you know, put the employees into different grids, you have a great in-depth uh, uh, conversation with the employees, not only uh, the senior manager, but in HR and the other managers under whom this employee has worked or a period of one year. So the, the kind of conversation which takes place is very positive and very constructive. Hence, it improves overall, uh, uh, you know, the relationship and the uh, atmosphere within the organization. But there are some concerns, of course. Uh, uh, one of the important concern is uh, assessing potential objectives. Some people uh, do raise a you know concern that yes, uh, it fails to uh, assess potential of employees objectively. No, there are tools available. Uh, Psychomot, uh, you know, psychometric tools are used for assessing uh, their. Uh, attitude, various aspect of uh, uh, personality, etc. So, hence there are objective tools available. And another concern is about assigning employees to the grid. Uh, you know, there is a fear that uh, it creating labeling might create problems uh, among the employees. But as I mentioned earlier, since the dialogue that takes place. Uh, you know, between the managers, various managers and employees, so constructive, this kind of labeling will not have the kind of labeling uh, the, you know, bell curve had. Though, uh, there are certain cautions which managers should take. The first one is, HR and other managers must establish what is that they want out of this curve. Why are they using? They must predetermine it. <laughs> Second, Whatever the discussions happen and that, uh, you know, uh, grid assignments takes place, do not neglect it and don't use it for the sake of using it. Please act upon it. Hence, the effectiveness of this particular tool will be much greater. This is how the nine box model appears to be. You know, you have a potential categorized into three and so is a performance categorized in the Three. So all that which you have, you know, green boxes, they, they are high performance, star and high potential. So we can look towards, you know, assigning them much more challenging jobs, assigning them higher responsibility. Uh, for example, the high performer one who has a moderate potential, he can be improved on by training, then you have these yellow ones. See, the, the, the last one in the right bottom is a solid performance, but so have a poor potential. So the, the, the employee is too good on the current job, but he probably doesn't have any uh, potential for further promotions. So such people could be given a, a far more of, you know, incentive to maintain their current performances. And similarly, on the bottom, on the left, you have a risk employee. This kind of employee needs a lot of counseling and uh, uh, they could even be on the words of, uh, uh, you know, pushing out the organization. Adida, please mute who, who is on the speaker. Okay. I would relate this tool to another tool 
that is also you know developed by mckinsey it's called a g's nine cell matrix is a portfolio analysis tool so both are so similar the nine box which we discussed is of an individual performance and this is about the organization performance is talking about business unit strength on one uh, on on the x axis and it's talking about industry attractiveness which is equivalent to the industry potential so you get a similar kind of uh, assessment of your business uh, unit the way we got uh, you know assessment of an individual so basically uh, the nine box is taken from the nine cell g matrix of portfolio analysis tool so this is also used for strategic analysis and decision making similarly the other tool which we discussed is also used for analysis and strategic decision look at continuous performance management that means it, basic philosophy here is let's not wait for a year to assess employees let's keep assessing them on a regular basis now the major advantage of having a continuous performance management is you get a chance to apply correction on any deviations uh which you think the employee will be unable to meet whereas in uh, other methods which are being used on annual basis you never get a chance the year is gone means gone nothing can be done about the years past years performance so this is what is a new tool which is on the block for the performance up appraising employees on you know continuous basis so what we do here is before the start of the whatever the appraisal year is mutually set the goals for the employees and on every month or two month basis meet him assess find out how is he doing whether he is on the goal meeting or not whether he is having certain problems whether he needs moderation of the goals whether whether he needs any support any kind of a uh, uh, you know weakness in terms of skill sets or anything else or any drastic change in uh, environment that has taken place which might cause a poor performance at the end of the year would be realized okay and i'll just run through i have a technology enabled continuous performance management that means use the technology to the hilt you can continuously measure them i have one uh, you know a typical example of uh, mundra port where <clears throat> adani uses technology for measuring the performance of its drivers you know the trucks are fitted with iot devices and sensors to know whether the driver is over speeding uh, using unwanted brakes applying sudden brakes so based upon that continuous performance uh, you can you know assess and call back the driver and give necessary counseling so that you have a timely action on it power lock curve i'll quickly discuss with you power lock curve actually is based upon power law distribution which means if there are two variables one dependent and another dependent he says if you bring a relative change in the independent variable it will cause a relative change proportional relative change on the dependent variable for example if you have a line which is 2 cm long and and 2 cm long uh, sorry breadth your uh, area would be 4 cm square if if you change that size of the line to 4 cm the your area would would quadruple that means it's go by four times uh, that means your uh, your equation here is y is equal to kx 
square x being the dependent variable and y being the independent variable this curve implies that small amount of occurrences are uh, cause large occurrences sorry i'm sorry small amount of occurrences are quite common but large occurrences are very rare what i'm trying to say other way around is this could be equated with pareto's pareto's law that means 20% phenomena causes 80% events that if you take it to the organization you say there are very few people in an organization who are the causes for great performance of the organization and that is true in knowledge economy look at the you know some of the professions like sportsmen uh advertising creativity singers film personalities politicians you know you can go on where individual skills matter quite a lot i can also give another example of uh, say distribution of income there are very rare billionaires in the world who has 80% of the wealth with them and only 20% wealth is with majority of the people large population so similar examples could be had in terms of size of, of corporation trading volumes in stock exchanges uh, wealth gain due to rise in stocks you know someone who has hold a major shares in organization will get a much greater wealth than the small uh, holding uh, individuals mm -hmm. and similarly it is also uh, very close to the gips law uh, which states its most frequent words used in a book will appear twice as often as the second most which will appear as many times as the third most and so on and so forth you know so the law pareto law uh, it's though not a scientific one but it is uh, quite equivalent to the uh, the phenomena of organizational performance just look at just look at the law what is it saying is saying a uh, performance on the y axis and total number of people on the x axis if you look at there are only small people who are responsible for hyper performance and it is called a l curve because the shape of the curve is like an l so from it you know peak it drops suddenly which indicates a very small number of people responsible for large amount of performance and then you have a broad range of average performers and a very small uh, range of low performers so this curve fits perfectly in today's kind of business or today's kind of economy when we talk about knowledge economy look at if you try to use normal distribution curve over the l curve what happens that means in today's current situation that is uh, your uh, knowledge economy where the job profiles are much different from each other and you try to use a uh, uh, bell curve over the l curve l curve perfects to the knowledge economy so what happens you overestimate the performance and underestimate the performance that means people who are higher performers you underestimate their performance because their performance is pushed towards the average performance similarly uh, all those average performers or a poor performers performance is overestimated because you have pushed a large number of people towards average perform performances which was supposed to be there in the l curve 
So using, again, uh, my point which I'm trying to emphasize why I want to bury the bell curve is when you use a bell curve in the current uh, economic uh, conditions where you have knowledge economy dominance, you estimate the performance of the people of uh, high performers and or estimate the performance of average or a lower performances. I'm sure uh, that uh, a lot of people must have got good idea about it. I'm now open to the questions for last uh, 10 minutes. If any questions, please come back. Dr. Adit? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you for this wonderful session. Uh, thank you so much. I'm pretty sure that uh, audiences must have gained a lot from this session, especially when uh, our Honorable Vice Chancellor shared uh, uh, the uh, things about the facts about the conventional uh, bell curve and uh, he shared uh, about uh, the nine box model L curve and continuous performance management. So these all these concepts must have uh, helped you and gaining a lot of uh, new uh, insights into the uh, this bell curve and alternative uh, performance appraisal tools. You now, could also for some questions. Yeah, now the session is open. Uh, the audiences can uh, uh, put their questions or queries if they have, and uh, we are there to answer your queries. Audiences, please. I request audience to please first raise a hand and unmute themselves, and then uh, please raise your question. Uh, I think there seems no question. No question. Yeah, since there are no questions, thank you so much for being a passing listener. We had a very good session. And still more than 100 people are hooked to the session. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Another topic. Bye-bye. I'll definitely come back on some more interesting topics in the future. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.